Members, the question is the motion be agreed. Thank you. The Honourable Jim Chow. Uh, Madam President, um, I'm sure that most members struggle with the content of their valedictory address. I know I certainly have uh, over the last uh, few weeks. So much to say, but as always, relevance in a speech is important, so here we go. I'll commence by saying I'm bitterly disappointed that your tenure as President of this House, Madam President, will not continue into the 41st Parliament. It has been my absolute privilege to be a member of this place when you were first elected as the first female President of the Legislative Council in the 40th Parliament. Madam President, you have presided over a number of controversial and at times adversarial debates in this place, and you've conducted your presidency in a highly professional and non-partisan manner. You've also been President of this House uh, when it's been challenged on what is the most fundamental requirement, whether it is spoken or written, and that is the basic democratic right of privilege. Privilege for members of parliament allows them to represent their communities and issues within those communities as they see them and allows them to do so without fear of legal uh, retribution. Madam President, you have fearl fearlessly represented the current rights of this House and have done your best to maintain over 300 years of tradition to uphold democracy as we know it today. On this matter, I will repeat the Governor's speech when he opened the Parliament two weeks ago, and I quote, With your election, your constituents have put their faith in you. That is a solemn responsibility. As we look around the globe, we see that faith in democratic process is declining. This is dangerous because the only alternative is authoritarian government. The first step in the process is always an attack on the integrity of the democratic system. In Australia, we protect that better than anyone else." Unquote. I fully agree with Governor Beasley's comments. However, he omitted in these comments that democracy as we know it today is being challenged right here in this state of Western Australia. It is my opinion that the barbarians are at the gates in regard to the fundamental right of parliamentary privilege in this place. I fully comprehend the pressure you must have come under in regard to this matter, as I have spent some time last year being publicly vilified by a Premier and the Attorney-General for doing nothing more than carrying out my responsibilities as enshrined in the legislation regarding the appointment of a Triple C Commissioner. These comments were inappropriate, they were lies and they had no foundation in fact and were unworthy of a Premier. I think it absolutely abhorrent that any member of any committee of this parliament should be vilified in this manner because a government was unable to get its way. The Triple C Committee rejected the Premier's nomination not, not once, but twice on two separate occasions. That rejection was carried out as there was neither a majority support or bipartisan support for the nominee. Parliamentary committees and their members carry out important work on behalf of West Australian Committee on a plethora of subjects, and they do so on the whole in a bipartisan manner that arises above daily political argy-bargy. This is the fundamental reason why committee deliberations remain within the committee and any breach of these confidential discussions by a member of the committee is considered, once proven, to be a contempt of parliament. Yet here we are, with a member of the Triple C Committee that I belong to took it upon himself to breach this convention and had the protection of the government in the other place in a motion that could, could possibly have put him before the Privileged Committee. And it is now, as I understand it, to be rewarded as the new chair of the incoming Triple C Committee. I remember an occasion on the farm when one of my young daughters, one of the twins, asked me, how can you tell the difference between a snake and a worm? And my response was, snakes slither. They have scales and are completely untrustworthy. There is no such thing as a good snake, and the best policy is to give them a wide berth. Madam President, I will conclude this portion of my address by saying you have been magnificent. As President of this Council, I wish your successor the very best in these turbulent times, and as I believe it's worth repeating, the barbarians are truly at the door of democracy in this great state, and if it all fails, lock the doors. Um, Members, I will now move on to more pleasant matters. And a valedictory address is really a speech on self-reflection. And before I get to some of my achievements of a member of this place, I'd like to share with you a couple of humorous moments that have been in my memory for years 
and will for, be probably forever remain there. And they were made by members of this council. And one of the great things about stem, spending time is, is, is actually listening to members on their feet and participating in their conversations with interjections um, when the time permits. And, and the first one that I recall was from the late Honourable Jock Ferguson. Jock became a member of the 38th Parliament in September 2008, and sadly he wasn't with us for very long before he went off to that great trade fall in the sky. We all enjoyed Jock's company. I know I certainly did. And especially he had this very annoying habit of first addressing any Liberal member he came across as comrade. But the occasion I'm alluding to is when the Honourable uh, 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 the Honourable Norman Moore uh, had carriage of a bill, and during Norman's second reading speech, John Jock interjected with a comment that I recall to the best of my knowledge went along the lines that this legislation is as useful as a glass eye that has a crack in it. Um, the other interjection that is also indelibly etched in my memory is from the Honourable Sue Elry, who was the leader of the opposition at the time and interjected on a government Liberal member who only on very rare occasions rose to his feet to address the council. And one of these rare occasions, the member was on his feet giving a five minute dissertation on what was wrong with the world. And uh, the Honourable Sir Ellery interjected with the pithy comment, and that's TH Hansard. <laughs> and I quote once again from the best of my memory, she said, what a shame. The member's political career peaked in opposition. <laughs> we do have some fun at this place at times. And, and, and so if you can't remember who you said that to, I'll remind you later. <laughs> um, I, I'm sure that every member that arrives here does so with the intention of achieving positive outcomes for the electorate they represent. I know I certainly did. And I'll now touch on some of the achievements I successfully accomplished as a member over the last 12 years. And when I first arrived here um, as a member, I was a very nervous Nelly. I mean, I didn't sleep for the first nine months, um, especially after the house sitting. My mind was in turmoil and trying to catch up with what actually happened. But uh, on, and I'll move forward to, to uh, what I was going to actually say. And on the 29th of December 2009, um, and it was in the early years of the Barnett government, um, massive bushfire raced through the town of 2J and surrounds. Um, and the day after that particular fire, and at the time about 28, 29 homes had been totally destroyed. 2J was closed off. Uh, only residents uh, were allowed, and no one was allowed out, I don't think, but no one was allowed in, but only residents were allowed to, 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 to remain in 2J. And the day after that fire, uh, one of the Premier's um, principal advisers, John Hammond, called me and said, uh, the Premier's going up to the 2J fire, would you like to come? And I said, yes, yeah, certainly. I said, uh, actually, I'm in shorts and thongs. Um, and he said, well, you need to get changed and we'll pick you up in half an hour. And the Premier arrived outside of my house and we picked me up and off we went to 2J in the morning. And on the way up there, we were just discussing what had happened. And, uh, I, and I'd had a bit of feedback uh, from, from people up there already. And I said to Colin, I said, do you, do you understand that at this stage, over 20 homes have been burnt to the ground. Most of those residents actually lived with nothing but the clothes on their backs. And they are actually living in the town uh, on charity from friends uh, and, and relations or anybody that can help them. And I said, wouldn't it be good if we could give them some of their dignity back and, a, and we gave them, if we could give them a cash grant so they had some independence and in what their life going forward would be over the, until they re-established themselves. Um, they, they'd lost their bank accounts, their wallets, they had no identities at all other than the people that knew them. Um, and if they could even just go out and buy a meal somewhere and repay them, their hosts in this terrible time. And he said, there was silence, and then he said, yeah, I think that's a good idea. He said, how much do you suggest? I said, that's above my pay grade. I mean, I'm <laughs> you asking me how much. And I, I thought quite conservatively, I said, oh, I thought about, I thought about two and a half thousand dollars per home would be more than adequate. And he, and he thought a minute and there was silence again. He said, no, he said, let's make it five thousand dollars. And that's what happened. 
Um, so we arrived in TJ uh, the, immediately the day after um, the, to a town hall meeting. The town hall was packed of 2J people, many of them in severe distress. And the emergency service and the police got up. And this, this went on on a daily basis for more than a week, these town hall meetings, just so people were informed of what was happening, what was going to take place, um, and how the government uh, and, and, and emergency services, etc., were going to come to their aid and re establish their lives. And the Premier got up and made the announcement. He said a few words and he said, uh, and We will be uh, allocating a $5,000 grant to anybody whose house um, has burnt to the ground. And he, and, he, and he pointed to me and he said, you are the man, he said, you, you'll have to come up and do this. Um, so I was appointed as the uh, Premier's coordinator to deal with the community issues up there. So I went back the next day and at the town hall meeting, um, emergency services went through the process again and the town hall was absolutely packed with people. And I sat down with the shire clerk at the time and uh, he, the, uh, 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 he had, had, uh, had the, um, the deeds of all the places and, and we knew exactly the residents involved and signed $5,000 cheques for these unfortunate people. It was a Saturday morning and um, I'd arranged for the Bendigo Bank to actually open its doors so these people could go across and cash their money and they could get cash or open an account and put the excess into an account and that's what happened. Um, and after that particular meeting, I went outside, as is my habit, as you all know, and had a cigarette. And um, this lady came up, and she would have been, I don't know what age, I won't even try and guess. And she came up and she said, I've been nominated, thank you. And I, I said, oh, what for? And she said, I have, for the last three days, and she pointed to a group of people over there, and we, we've all lost our homes. She said, I've had nothing but the clothes I'm wearing in. I'm living with people who I really don't know, and you have given me and us our dignity back, and we have now some individuality in regard to what we can do, and we, we feel like we have been brought back into the community at large. Um, that particular $5,000 grant was carried out through the whole Barnett years, for, especially on homes that were lost in bushfire disasters, and I'm very happy to see that this government has something similar in place, and I do know that uh, $5,000 $5, grant is now being allocated to those poor unfortunate people who lost their homes in the recent cyclone Saroja. Um, there was another occasion, of course, that um, I was highly involved in, and, and a good friend of mine, Graham Nixon, at the time was the chair of the McCusker Foundation. And he contacted me and he said, Jim, is there any way you can um, get some money out of this government, this new government, to give us to the McCusker Foundation? I, I had no idea what the McCusker Foundation was actually about. And um, so I, I, I went and had a look at the McCusker Foundation and, and I, the first time I met Professor Ralph Martin's AO. And they do a fantastic job in regard to the research of Al Alzheimer's disease. And we're all growing older. older. We're all living longer and it's becoming more and more prevalent in our community. If you look at the figures going forward to 2030, 2040, 2050, the number of people who will succumb to this disease is just mind-boggling. Um, but regardless of that, um, so I, I came back and Troy was the, was the treasurer at the time and as I've always done with these matters, I've been trying to be highly professional and I understand ministers and premiers are extremely busy. So I prepare just one pager of the relevant points that needed to be discussed and why I was pursuing this uh, a particular outcome. And I badgered Troy uh, on a number of occasions for some monies to be donated to the McCusker Foundation. And I was not getting any response. And when the budget came down in 2011, I think it was, um, he came to me and said, you, in that budget, there's some money from the McCusker Foundation, and it, ended, it turned out to be $2.2 million for the McCusker Foundation, and that money was sourced uh, out of the final amount monies left in the old Carpenter Government Science and Innovation Fund. Um, and I, I was very grateful for that for Troy. Um, couldn't find it in the budget, and it wasn't a line item, but it was there. Um, the McCusker Foundation was very grateful for it. That triggered another substantial donation out of the Commonwealth, and in turn, as, um, as, as Ralph uh, told me on a flight back from Queensland, 
uh, where I just happened to meet, sit next to him, um, he, he said that actually also triggered substantial funds and donations out of the United States of America. And I wish the Foundation all the very best, and I, I know they will continue uh, doing the fantastic work, in, in, in especially uh, trying to find a way, and they're nearly there, I think, or if they haven't already, how to do an early diagnosis of this particular disease. The, um, around the time, it was at the time that uh, the Honourable Terry Redmond was the Minister for Agriculture, and I'd been down to Catanning and met the Catanning Shire, and they had an issue with their sale yards, which were actually situated in the middle of town. The sale yards didn't meet the animal welfare requirements. Um, the access with modern transport was tight, if in, totally inadequate. And when you put over a million sheep through a particular sale yard, um, if you're anywhere in the town, you know when sale day is on because you can smell it. It's as simple as that. And they wanted to move their sale yards and make them more modern uh, somewhere else. In the meantime, I'd actually been to a briefing in the Liberal Party room, which was um, put on by the Honourable Terry, the Minister of Agriculture at the time. And he wanted to also build new sale yards, but he wanted to move them to Arthur River, which was some way out of the town side of Catanning. And once those sale yards were built, he, he actually wanted the new New Shale sale yards and the new Catanning sale yards, which uh, combined values of around $80 million of public money is being spent on them, to be leased out to a superannuation investment company called Palisade Resources who were leasing and uh, administrating sale yards in the eastern states. I didn't think that was a great idea, considering that we only have two particular, two large sale yards in this state, and I wasn't happy about it and I actually walked out of the briefing. Um, so once again I went to work and I put a briefing paper together and I went to the Premier's office and spoke to one of his advisers. And I said, look, I've been to Catanning and they believe they can build new sale yards once they find an appropriate place for them for $20 million and they would like $17 million out of this government because they can find the rest. And I heard nothing back. So if you're persistent professional and until somebody says, no, go away, you will not get rid of me. And after a few more weeks, I repeated that exercise. And I went back to the Premier's office, and one of his people sat down with me, and they were very respectful, and I spent half an hour going through it again. Still nothing hurt. And one day, and this was probably another three or four weeks later, I get a phone call. And timing is important in life and in politics, believe me. And this particular person from the Premier's office said, what are you doing at three o'clock this afternoon, Jim? And I thought, hang on, nobody rings up and asks that sort of question from the Premier's office without a good reason. And I said, of course, why? And they said, well, we'd like you to meet the Premier at three o'clock to discuss your proposal of a grant for the Catanning sale yards. And I said, fine, I'm happy to do that. Yes, I'll go and meet the Premier and do that. But I said, well, why three o'clock? And they said, well, he's meeting Terry Redmond at four o'clock and we want him to say yes to you first. He said that he has to say no to Terry's proposal. <coughs> and that's exactly what happened. Um, <laughs> and a grant of $17 million came out of the Barnett government. Uh, those sale yards are state of the art. They're the largest undercover sheep area in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, they cost $26 million which is virtually half of what Mouchet cost. They were built by locals. They are still conducted by the Catanning Shire. Um, and if you're ever down there, I suggest you go and have a look at them. Um, they've done a fantastic job. Um, and that was, yeah. And we did open it. Uh, uh, Ken was the minister and I went down with Ken and the Premier and uh, they were open in, the, on, in, on, in, in May 2014. Another matter that I became involved with was the Year 7 transition. Um, and you all know what that is, you know, Year 7s go off to middle school, or well, you certainly would, 
and it was an adoption from the eastern states. And it was going to have uh, pretty negative effects on a number of schools in my electorate. Um, and I wrote to every PNC present in my electorate. And I told them it was likely to happen, and I was happy to receive feedback on how this particular matter could be resolved. And you need to remember, members, and the members from the agriculture region would certainly be aware that there's a number of small primary schools out there that are quite isolated. And you know, to use their set year sevens in a cliff face arrangement was going to, in some of them, um, you know, take their student numbers down to critical levels. There was a um, st the Standing Committee on Public Administration looked into the matter and they had hearings and wrote a report and made recommendations. I never read it um, because I knew exactly what I was going to do on this matter. And every year I would conduct a tour with the Premier throughout the agriculture region and sometimes it would be one or two nights uh, these tours were, um, were, were timed to the minute. Uh, they were always public meetings and places of interest, and, um, and they were highly successful. And I'm pretty sure Colin actually enjoyed them. And when we'd start at seven o'clock in the morning, and we wouldn't get to bed until 10:30 at night. <clears throat> but on this particular occasion, I decided to take our tour from here to Geraldton, and I'd organised a large public meeting in the Shire of Karoo of which over 100 local people turned up because I knew that the, the local business there, the local John Deere agent, uh, who was a very good uh, orator in effect, and he, when Colin gave his address and token question, he, he said to the Premier, he said, what's this year seven transition thing about? He said, don't you understand that these children, if, if, if they are suddenly have to go to a high school somewhere else or to a boarding school somewhere else, it's of great expense to the parents, and most of them haven't saved for that expense. And secondly, you are actually cutting into my workforce. He said a lot of these children that go away, if they'd stayed within the community, uh, become my apprentices. And once the children in rural communities leave, they rarely come back. That night we stopped in Geraldton, and I think Colin got the message. That night we stopped in Geraldton, and over a bottle, over a dinner and a bottle of wine, he said, "Now, what's this? I know you've been on about this uh, year seven transition. What's your solution?" And I said, "Well, obviously it can't be stopped, but how about we have some sort of process where it can be gradual, so people can become used to it." So. Families can actually make their own arrangements over a period of time, and that's pretty much what happened. Um, it was decided that this transition on, would be voluntary uh, on certain small primary schools. It would be voluntary on the application of a parent through the system, and uh, a number of schools adopted that and took it on. I think the transition period finished in 2017 and now Year 7s, of course, all go to middle school somewhere else. I know my, my daughter's uh, <coughs> child will soon be going from Kalani to Del Wallanew, and that's an hour and a half bus ride in the morning and an hour and a half bus ride in the evening. That's three hours on a bus, five days a week for a year seven, and he won't be the only one. And this is replicated throughout the region in a number of small primary schools. Um, I'm a believer in competition. I've always been a believer in competition. I think competition gives you the best service, it'll give you the best price, and it will give you the best product. And CBH in this state, and I was involved uh, at a Commonwealth level with some great people. Ian Bradley is no longer with, with us uh, on trips to lobby the um, federal government at the time, the Howard government, to take the monopoly away from the Australian Wheat Board. In the end, it was a Labor government that did that, and the outcome is beneficial to West Australian growers by millions of dollars a year. 
However, now we have a, 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 a similar monopoly in CBH, and I'm not decrying the fact that CBH is our monopoly grain handler in this state, and I'm not saying that they're inefficient, but I know they can do better. And Bungie is the second last largest grain acquirer in the world, came to me and actually wanted to start exporting grain out of Bunbury Port. And once again, uh, Troy was the Minister for Transport and Port, so I went to him and all they did wanted to do, there wasn't going to be a lot of public monies involved, they just wanted the licence and the land allocation at Bunbury Port to set up over Siebel Point. And after some lobbying that actually happened, um, they actually had a receivable point at Arthur River eventually and another one further inland, and they spent $90 million building a state-of-the-art receivable port at Bunbury Port. They, their handling charges were less than CBHs by a good number of dollars. And growers in the area, and one of them growers said it was going to save him $50,000 to $80,000 a year by going to the competition. What, and I was involved in that at a very high level. Um, certainly the minister made the final decision, but it wouldn't have happened unless Bungie had come to me and I'd gone through the process. And it's one of the great things of being in government. You can actually achieve these things. Um, long story short, uh, it, was a, it was an absolute failure for Bungie. Uh, CBH met the local market pace. They actually lowered their handling fees, and that's fine. That's what competition's about. But Bungie couldn't sustain their commercial interest uh, because they started to lose tonnage. And I understand that, uh, that, 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 that it's now on the market um, as a non-operating entity. I, uh, I'm not a steward of Muresk, but as a member for the agriculture region, I certainly believe Muresk has a lot to add from an educational perspective, and it has done in the past, uh, for agriculture. And there was a time when the actual Muresk and I can't remember what, who it was combined with locally. It was one of the um, universities. CY O'Connor. CY O'Connor, yeah. Um, well, what was the university here? Curtin. Curtin University, yeah. And after, after a few years, that, that arrangement uh, went by the by and, 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 and uh, virtually closed down the Muresk Institution. Um, and then they started up again with a partnership with the Queensland University. And I went up there and, and, and became a little bit involved and encouraged them. And they, at the time, they had about, I think it was 22 students who had been enrolled in, in for a two or three year course. And I said, how can I help you? And they said, well, you know, we need more students. We need some encouragement. And people um, have, have, have lost a bit of faith in Muresk as such because there's been no, it's been irregular. And I said, well, how about if I can arrange a scholarship program and you guys can advertise that there is this scholarship program. Um, it may encourage other people to come along and become students. And they said, that's great. So I came back to the Liberal Party party room. I put a proposal forward, um, and that was going to be a $5,000 scholarship. It was going to be called, and it was called the Sir David Brand Scholarship Program. And the Premier said, that's fine. Um, I've been to most members, or all members, and they, they approved it. And, uh, and the only caveat was that, um, as the Premier said, the things change in politics, Jim. The best thing to do is you only make this a four-year or a term, government term contract because there may be less members um, after the next election. And there were. Um, so that program went into place, and uh, that's what's happened. Uh, and there's a number of other I won't bore members any further with some of my achievements, but the list is long. Um, and it hasn't been boring at all. Um, it's been quite exciting. Um, one of the most satisfying aspects of being a member of parliament is the opportunity to help individuals with difficulties they are experiencing. Most of the time it's listening to the grievances or helping them to gain access or find the right direction for departmental inquiries and resolutions. It is my experience that most people access a member's office when the wheels have truly fallen off the matter they are struggling with. And I'm sure we've all had the similar experiences, and I wish that people would utilise 
the services our officers provide more often and earlier when the wheels commence to wobble. Uh, and then the problem is uh, easier to overcome rather than trying to rectify something that is in its terminal stages. We have all helped and we continue to help individuals with our electorates on a whole range of subjects. And getting positive outcomes for people I find to be, and I'm sure we all do, to be most gratifying. But at times it actually takes a great deal of work and more work than the person you're trying to help actually realises. And one of the most gratifying incidents my office has dealt with took place in the dying years of the Gillard government. And one of my girls had a call, and I was actually leaving the office, I think, to come in. She said, Jim, you need to take this call. Now, when one of my staff say that, you know that they are serious. So I took the call. And it's from a young lady, and I won't mention her name, uh, from a quite a large country town in my electorate. And she said, Mr Chan, I'm just bringing you. Um, I'm hoping you can help me. I am being... Uh, uh, not exported, what's the word? Um, no, removed from the country. Deported, deported, thank you. Exported, deported. Uh, within, a, within, <laughs> within, 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 within uh, two and a half weeks. And I said, OK. And I said, how long have you been here? She said, I've been here for over five years. Um, I fled the UK. Um, I, I now have a, a partner. I've integrated in the community. I've got a job. I love being here. Um, but the problem, if I'm deported, is my life will be in danger. I said, why is that? And she said, well, when I was <coughs> 21, and I have, a little, I have my daughter with me as well in, in this country, when I was 21 and my daughter was less than 12, my partner um, tried to stab me to death and attacked her uh, and almost killed her. And she said, I've recovered from that and I left the UK. And she lived on an island on the, off, off the mainland. And she said, this deport, de deportation order will put me in jeopardy because the perpetrator of the crime is due to leave prison at about the same time I get back to home. And I only have one place to go where I can go, and that's back to my mum on this island. And I said, how do you know this? And she said, well, he has tracked me down through social media. I have emails and messages from him that are all subtly, subtly threatening, and I'm very concerned. So at, the, at, at this time, Sue, my wife, was working for Senator Matthias Cormann in his office in Canberra. And part of her role was liaising with the Department of Immigration. In fact, she had a, such a good rapport with the department that it was uh, for at least two years after she left uh, Matthias's office, she would get calls from people seeking help or thanking her. And some of the calls were actually from European countries <laughs> trying to find out how they could become Australians. So she went into bat for this particular lady with the department. And in the meantime, we had needed to verify that this girl, what this girl saying was correct. So we looked up the court system on the internet. We tracked down the actual perpetrator's court case and we found that everything she said was correct in regard to the knife attack on her. We had the dates. And it came back from the Immigration Department through Matisse's office. We needed to verify that her life would be in danger. I mean, this is in a two, two week time frame um, that we had, to, we had to get this done uh, if she returned to the UK. Now, in that court case, the first responder was, to the incident was the local sergeant. So I contacted him, found out where he lived on this particular island. And he remembered the case. He knew both the people well involved. He had just retired. And I explained to him what the situation was and would he please write a letter giving his opinion in regard to whether this lady's life would be in jeopardy if she returned. And that letter came back within uh, 48 hours 
it said everything, backed up everything she said, and he, in fact he was very explicit. He said, if this young lady returns to this particular place, I have no doubt that this person, once she <coughs> is released from jail, will find her and certainly um, try to finish the job that he nearly did on a previous occasion because he knew, knew him very well. That letter went off to the uh, Department of Immigration and the Minister in the Commonwealth does have the ability to change deportation orders and that happened. She, 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 she was given permanent res residency and that lady today now is a citizen of this country. She has remarried, she has another child and uh, that was quite frankly um, a really great occasion for me. Um, a very positive outcome uh, as a humble member of this place. Um, I'm, I'm proudly standing here um, as a supporter of the Voluntary Assistant Dying Board. And myself and this young gentleman beside me, the Honourable Yorn Sidmer, are the only Liberals. OK, he's a bit shaky here, true. Um, were the, are the only members who have actually supported that bill. And I also supported a number of the amendments to the bill that were put forward by the Honourable Nick Garan and others in this place. I think uh, if the McGowan government achieved anything in the last term, it was certainly achieved, that, that was a particular achievement they need to be proud of. And I think the community at large is most grateful that we now have that sort of legislation in place in this state of Western Australia. Um, I um, was quoted in the press as undecided on more than one occasion. I had a reason for that, I might add, which I'll maybe get into. But one day I had a phone call from my mum. She's 96 years old. And she said, Jim, what are you doing? I said, what are you talking about, mum? She said, I've just read in the paper that you're undecided about the VAD bill. And I said, yeah, that's right, mum. And she said, don't you realise I may use it or need it at some time? <laughs> so I, I explained to her that she was in great health and uh, I doubt that, that very much, but uh, thanks for the phone call. Um, I was undecided and I've put a motion up in this place and, 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 and the Honourable Nick Garan and others have done a great little work on that uh, in regard to palliative care. Um, my motion was supported. I was undecided because I believed this government, if it wanted to go forward with the VAD bill, it needed to put more money into palliative care. I actually made public the deplorable state of palliative care in this state, certainly in regional Western Australia. Um, and of course, the government has now spent, I think, nearly $40 million over and above its normal expenditure in palliative care, and there are programs in place. And I'm very happy to have been part of that process. Um, I still don't believe that palliative care is at the level it should be in Western Australia. And I would encourage government members the next time they see their Minister for Health, um, regardless of whether we're in crisis or not in crisis, um, that palliative care should be, uh, have programs and certainly increased funding is going forward. Um, so, and we do have a, an ageing population. Um, I will move on now to a series of thank yous. And I'd like to thank uh, two of my long-standing staff in my electorate office, and that's Marianne Lehman and uh, Kylie Watkinson, two highly professional ladies. Um, I'd like to thank them sincerely for keeping both of my feet on the ground. Um, I thank them for the many robust discussions we have had on all sorts of matters. I certainly don't thank them for the, all the occasions that when I've decided to put these discussions to a vote, they've vote, both ganged up together and won, won, the, <laughs> won the vote. Two to one does not work. Um, and I, just a couple of little anecdotes about these ladies. Um, <clears throat> when Mike Nahan was leader of the opposition, we went down to, um, on a charter flight to um, Esperance and Mike had a staff member and Senator Brockman was with us and he had a staff member and Kylie was with me and there was me on, on, the, on the flight, on the charter. And we had a great day in Esperance and Kylie had um, organised 
where they went and helped them with their baggage and gave them directions, etc. And when we got off the flight, I was actually talking to the pilot and I noticed she'd grabbed their bags and stood at the end of the wing and they all lined up in a queue. And as they're going past, they're shaking a hand, taking their bag, shaking their hand and having a bit of a, bit of a little laugh and giggle and moving on. But it never happened before. Very strange. And on the way back in the car, I said, what was that about? And she said, uh... She said, uh, they were thanking me for the, for the assistance during the day. And uh, they were also wondering how I, how I put up with you. <laughs> and, and, uh, and another one anecdote about Marion. Marion's Mar 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 a great person, um, great at her job, great with people, but very, very shy. And during the VAD bill, of course, uh, Andrew Denton came to some of our offices and um, I was in my office, I think Kylie was away momentarily uh, with a medical appointment, and Denton came and knocked on the door. And Marion went to open the door, was overcome with shyness, ran off to the kitchen and left poor Andrew standing there looking through the glass, wondering if he'd just grown another head. <laughs> so I'm still sitting there thinking, well, well when's she going to open the door and bring him in? So I got up and there and went out and then Andrew's still standing there. So I let him in. She didn't come out of the kitchen until he'd left. Um, and we had a, a great discussion on, on the VAD, etc. Um, and I thank both of you sincerely from the bottom of my heart, of my heart for um, being such great people. I'd also like to uh, thank Peter Collier. Peter, uh, for, for eight years while I've been here, has been leader uh, of the Liberal Party in this House. Um, I, he, he's been, as a leader, he's been completely inclusive. He has been uh, generous in his remarks and generous with his support to all of us, including myself. Um, he has shown great leadership skills. And in opposition, those leadership skills, along with the Honourable Mike Mission, came to the fore as he harnessed the sentiment of the crossbenchers uh, in this place. Um, and to my colleagues here, I think you're a bunch of wonderful people. Um, we do have some good times together. And I think, I can't remember what the bill was, but um, one of the Green members, when I came into the House and I was giving an address, and I said, at the discussion this over, over our dinner break, it was decided that this was the best course of action to undertake. And uh, she said, do you really discuss things at dinner? <laughs> it was you. <laughs> I said, yes, we do. And we have a lot of fun as well. And that's what real teamwork's about. That's, it's about trust in each other. It's about giving each other a leg up. It's about supporting each <coughs> other. Uh, uh, when the occasion arises, <coughs> and I thank you for all of that. Um, I would like to uh, thank my wonderful family, um, Sue, my twin daughters, Alika and Rebecca, and my youngest, Tiffany, who has been in London for a couple of years now, uh, doing fantastic things over there. Uh, their spouses, Doug and Edward, and, and the five grandchildren. I thank you for your support. I won't say too much because I'll get too emotional. Um, I. Uh, now we'll have more time on my hands and I'm prepared to undertake any task that you may uh, push my way. Uh, but I will draw the line, Edward and Alica, at walk, walking Oscar. He's too long, his legs are too short, he's too old, he's too grumpy and it's just embarrassing when his tummy gets caught in the kerb as he's coming across the road. But you will see more of me, for better or for worse. And I'm very proud of you. I'm proud of what you achieved as uh, young people, and uh, you've been, you will be great, you are great citizens of this great state and this magnificent country. We were very lucky uh, 12 months ago, just before COVID, we, as a whole family, we went to the UK and we had Christmas with Tiff over there, and we travelled around Europe. Um, there were 14 of us, and um, we got back, and three weeks later, COVID broke, and, and uh, I hope we can do it again at some stage in the near future. Um, to the members, to the, to, the, to the staff of this parliament, 
from the clerk to the chef. I thank you from the bottom of my, of my heart, um, you, your professionalism, how you make people feel welcome, how you actually discharge your duties is quite outstanding. I, as, a, as a new member, when I first came here, I thought, the staff know my name. How can that happen? <laughs> but they knew all the new members' names. They knew everybody's names. I thought, these people, they either go to a special school and rehearse, or they've got fantastic memories. At the, and at the same time, a number of years later, I, I happened to be in the kitchen just after the 13th election. And there on the kitchen wall <laughs> are photos of all the new members and their names. I thought, there's the secret. Every, eventually, you'll remember who's who. I, I think this place would be nothing but a hollow shell if it wasn't for the staff. And um, once again, thank you. Um, keep up the good work. And I'm sure you will be adequately rewarded <laughs> by the members uh, voicing their gratitude on occasions such as this. I wish all members of this place the absolute best into the future. And I, <coughs> and I, ah, deep breath. And I thank them for their tolerance in having me as a serving member in this place. Well done, the Honourable Jim Chown, and the best of luck in Thank wherever you. your future takes you.